My name is Leonard Leo. I'm with the Federalist Society, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's great to see all of you here this evening for uh, what will be the last uh, event of the year for the Young Lawyers Division. Uh, it's especially uh, exciting to f for us to be here and to see all of you uh, come out for this event and some of the others that the Young Lawyers Division has done. Uh, Lisa Ezel, our Vice President for Lawyers, uh, has uh, worked hard to uh, establish these young lawyers groups around the country. I think our two most vibrant right now being being here in Washington and one in New York. But uh, your success here in Washington and some of the success in New York has uh, driven up demand. And so there are a number of other cities around the country that want to replicate what you do here. And um, I just want to reinforce the fact that the Federalist Society has always been an institution that, by and large, has been uh, occupied and owned by its young, the, the law students, the young lawyers. This was the tradition of the Federalist Society going back to the early and mid-1980s. And so to have um, you know, uh, a great community of very talented, smart, um, driven younger lawyers from the Hill and from the executive branch and from law firms here in town is so important f to the future growth and, and success of the, uh, uh, of the Federalist Society. So thank you for your participation and um, hopefully for some of you for your current or future leadership in the organization. Well, uh, what we have in store for you tonight is uh, an interview or conversation between uh, Lisa Ezel, again, the vice president of our lawyers, so who many of you, if not all of you, know, uh, and Senator John Kyle, who all of you obviously know of. Uh, now, Senator Kyle doesn't really need any introduction in terms of, of his distinguished background. Uh, you know, you are all familiar, I'm sure, with his many years of very distinguished service in the Senate. Uh, I came to know him when he was uh, a part of leadership in the Senate, fought many important battles, uh, a number of which pertain to uh, Supreme Court and Court of Appeals nominations and confirmations. Uh, and uh, of course, the senator, uh, in addition to playing a key leadership role and a substantive role on judges and legal policy has played an important role in defense and foreign policy and many other areas. What I want to focus on tonight, in, uh, in, instead of that distinguished career, is, is his statesmanship. Um, what has always struck me about Senator Kyle is uh, he is, I think, in the modern Senate, one of the great statesmen of that body. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Well, for one thing, uh, I know of no U.S. senator, at least in my professional life, uh, who has had uh, the kind of ability to sit down with members of all different perspectives and stripes throughout the body and uh, get their perspectives collect information and ideas, be asked for advice and counsel. I mean, that's the true mark of a statesman, the ability to, to, to reach out and to, uh, and to talk to a wide variety of people and to have that opportunity to persuade. And, and Senator Kyle has that, that, that skill uh, and that calling in a way that I haven't seen uh, in, in any other uh, senator over the course of my professional life. Also, I would add that, you know, the true mark of a statesman is, is sacrifice. And um, I think Senator Kyle has demonstrated that throughout his life, uh, you know, coming back and forth to Washington all the way from Arizona is no easy task. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, one of the greatest marks of the sacrifices he has made as a public servant has actually been later in his career when he came back here. Uh, to Washington to serve in the Senate again. Uh, this was a very significant um, sacrifice on his part and came at a time uh, when, uh, uh, when it wasn't necessarily easy or convenient 
to be coming back to Washington, personally, uh, and also, frankly, politically, because of the environment that we live in today. Uh, and so uh, I think that um, uh, we owe uh, an enormous debt of gratitude to Senator Kyle for his statesmanship and for his commitment to, uh, to public service, as well as for all the great things he's done, uh, helping to transform the judiciary uh, and helping to uh, develop our, uh, our, our defense and public diplomacy policy. So without further delay, uh, please join me in welcoming Senator Kyle along with Lisa, who is going to conduct what I'm sure will be a very interesting and uh, thought-provoking interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, I might begin by saying thank you, Leonard. I'm glad you thought I needed an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'll thank Leonard as well. And I want to thank you, Senator Kyle, on behalf of our Young Lawyers chapter for joining us here today. Um, I want to begin by asking you a bit about your experiences in Congress, as we have a number of Hill staff here today and others involved with the Federal Society's Article I initiative, which is dedicated to examining the role of Congress and its place in the constitutional order. And I can't think of someone better to offer some of his reflections on, on these questions than you. So first, you came to Congress in 1987 to the House and then to the Senate in 1995. What prompted you to decide to enter public service? My father had been a member of the House of Representatives from the state of Iowa, uh, entering just before I went off to college in uh, to Tucson. We, I grew up in Iowa. And uh, I saw him as a public servant in Washington. I didn't live with my parents, obviously. I was in Arizona. But uh, that had to have had an influence on me. I got in, I studied government in college, got my law degree, went to Phoenix, and became active in the Republican Party there primarily supporting candidates for the state legislature and similar offices. And all of that um, brought me into the party and uh, into the political milieu of Arizona. I never would have run for office if my congressman hadn't called me on July 4th, 1985, and said, I'm not going to run uh, next time, and I think you ought to think about it. And my wife and I thought about it on the way home, and uh, ultimately I decided I would go ahead and do that. And that was probably the toughest race I ran because I had a primary. Two, I had to run against two other people for an open seat in the primary. But after that, uh, it, uh, I won't say it was easy, but at least um, uh, I, I didn't ever have another primary opponent, and I'm glad for that. After you came to DC, what surprised you most about how Congress operated? Was it different from what you expected or? Well, coming the most recent time, I had been out for about five and a half years. <clears throat> and while partisanship was obviously a part of the game back then as well, it did seem to me that there was more, um, more of, a, of, of a chasm between uh, the Democrats and the Republicans than there had been in the past. I was welcomed very warmly by people on most sides of the aisle, and it's one of the things I'll really treasure about having come back. Um, the staff, the Capitol Police, the members, they were all very nice to me, and I really appreciate that. But boy, the two parties were estranged from each other. Remember, I helped to shepherd uh, Judge Kavanaugh through the six weeks or so prior to his hearing, and then he had his hearing, and that was the, we thought, almost the end of the game. Well, that was the end of the first half. And I was appointed to Senator McCain's seat at about the same time that Professor Ford made her allegation. So when I came back, it was like parachuting into the middle of a war zone. And if any of you were here during the last hearings, um, you know that it, I mean, the police literally had to clear the hallways of the office buildings for us to get anywhere. It was um, a pretty raucous environment, and that was not particularly enjoyable. What, um, going to turn, um, return back to the, the subject of um, your role supporting Justice Kavanaugh, um, but I want to have a couple more questions about, about Congress. Are there, 
you indicated that things have become more polarized uh, between from when you were first elected and in today. Do you have any, do you know why that is? Sometimes it's, you know, people spend more time going back to their home districts. You know, they have fewer friends on the other side of the aisle. <coughs> there, do you have there, any observations on that? Yeah, there are a lot of reasons for it and beware of the false ones. For example, when I went to college, the, uh, the big hot subject among political sciences was why don't the parties have a realignment and get real? You had Southern Democrats who were more conservative than the Republicans and liberal Republicans from New England that made some of the Democrats look like conservatives. Eventually, that transformation occurred, and it's all but completed. Olympia Snow is now the last Republican elected in New England. Um, and I don't know, I guess West Virginia might consider near South, but I don't think of, think of too many uh, senators, at least, uh, who, are, who would be considered relatively conservative uh, on the Democratic side. So there's been a party realignment. So when you talk about how uh, people in both parties used to get together, understand that a lot of the deals that were made were between the Northern Republicans and Democrats and the Southern Democrats and Republicans. Also, back then, pork was a big thing. Earmarks existed, and uh, basically, if you'll scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's how you made deals. And so there were a lot of deals. Uh, now, that's a situation that generally today people think was subject to too much political type of corruption. I don't mean legal corruption. And therefore, it's probably been a good reform of, of Congress. Uh, so there are a couple of situations where um, it's not the way it, people haven't changed all that much is what I'm saying. But there, there's also been a gradual erosion in the comity. And I'll give you one illustration of that. And it's, it's the personal behavior of the individuals that's really at stake here. I would caution anybody who's got a great idea about how to reform the system that you should think very carefully before you make a proposal about reforming the system. I can't remember now. Uh, I thought it was from Tale of Two Cities, but there's a, a book in which the, the uh, woman is sitting there knitting and uh, she says, Reform, sir, don't talk of reform. Things are bad enough already. <laughs> and that's the way most reforms of the process, especially political type reforms, end up working out. It's more a matter of the people. And here's the illustration. When Clarence Thomas was on the floor of the Senate for his confirmation, Ted Kennedy and Pat Lee were both uh, ardent uh, opponents, both members of the Judiciary Committee. And they both said at different times on the floor, we don't want justice or judge, we don't want Thomas to be a justice on the Supreme Court. And we could filibuster his nomination, require 60 votes, and he wouldn't win. But that would be wrong. And really, until after the 2000 election, there were no examples of filibustering judges, courts of appeal judges or U.S. Supreme Court justices. Remember, Clarence Thomas was confirmed 52 to 48 because Kennedy and Leahy did not filibuster. So as recently as that time, that was not deemed to be in good form. And I can remember when I first came to the Senate, Bob Dole was the leader at the time. Everybody got a right to offer amendments. Everybody got a vote on amendments. And I remember it was after Bob left as majority leader at some point, John McCain, my then colleague, came roaring onto the floor one day, and he was red hot because some Democrat wasn't being given an opportunity to offer an amendment and get a vote. Back then, that's the way things worked, because you didn't object every time to every idea that you thought was a bad idea and that you might get beat on. You let the other side have their votes, and they let you have your votes. And that all began to change. and so. It's not the rules. The rules have been the same all throughout. Uh, until, I should say, with regard to judicial nominations, as you all know, Harry Reid pulled the nuclear option and changed the rules with respect to district and, of course, of appeals. And then when the Gorsuch nomination came along, uh, Leader McConnell did the same for the Supreme Court. That actually was conforming the practice on confirmation of judges to the way it had always been. The filibuster existed but it had never been used until seven Court of Appeals judges, uh, President Bush, Miguel Estrada being one, you remember that famous, that whole series of those people were held up 
And Bill Frist, the majority leader at the time, was about ready, I think, maybe, to pull the trigger on the nuclear option and do the same thing that Harry Reid did for President Obama in his last year or last two years, I've forgotten which, uh, to eliminate the filibuster of Court of Appeals judges. But the gang of 14 interceded. They said, this would not be an idea, a, 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 a good idea to have the nuclear option and require just a majority vote, but neither is it a good idea to filibuster judges. And so we'd ought to simply exercise our good sense as senators and not do that. So they made a deal. And they agreed that except in extraordinary circumstances, they wouldn't support either proposition. Now, those 14 were enough that neither side had the ability, had the numbers to change things. So everything was frozen in time. And those 14, in effect, made a deal to let three or four of those judges go, and the others got filibustered. I've forgotten which. Um, but Miguel Estrada never made it to the court as a result. The system can work and people help to make it work if they have good sense. But what's happened in recent years, uh, defeat on anything is too serious a proposition to leave to chance. And therefore, we have to use every procedure, every rule, every political tool we have to prevent it from happening. Everything becomes a federal case. And so things don't get done, and everything gets objected to. Everything requires a 60-vote uh, majority. Mitch McConnell has now invoked cloture more times on judges. I've forgotten the exact number now, but it's more than all of the other leaders combined. That shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do that. And then it brings up uh, the issue, okay, if we're going to do away with the filibuster for confirmations, maybe we should do it for legislation too. Folks, that's not a good idea, and we can have a little discussion of that if you like. That will do a lot to hurt the institution. Again, I'll defer that conversation right now, but what I'm trying to illustrate is that changing the rules really can upset a lot of things, and what goes around comes around. So what seems like a great idea for you now may not be such a hot idea when the tables are turned and the other party is where you are and vice versa. It's a matter of dealing with your colleagues uh, as a matter of comedy, as a matter of courtesy, and understanding that traditions play a big part in the Senate, unlike the House. And if you treat each other right, generally everything works out right in the long run. Now in the House, as you all know from the House, it's established everything is done by rules and the majority wins. It's a purely majoritarian body. That's the way it was set up under the Constitution. It was supposed to be the people reflecting the passions of the moment. The people have spoken, we need to act to your terms Majority rules, I was in the minority in the House. I could have been that potted plant or, you know, majority has, I mean, the minority has only one right, and that's to motion to recommit to committee after you've already lost the big vote. So that's the only right the minority really has in the House. In the Senate, minority have a lot of rights. We need to keep it that way. I'll stop that debate right now unless you want to go back to it. But the short answer to the question, I guess, is if people acted the way they should, things would more or less be okay. But we've gotten into some bad habits where everything is elevated to such a white hot moment that the political leaders feel they have to do whatever's necessary to prevail in that moment. And this is driven a lot by our constituents who demand this of us. And they are driven a lot by <laughs> ne'er-do-well radio and TV talk personalities who don't know anything about the process, but boy, they have an opinion. And they want action, they want results, and they want them now, and they don't understand anything about what that could do to the institutions. And I'd love to have an opportunity to expand on that later too. <laughs> so the answer lies with people and leadership, not tinkering with the institutions, I believe. What is your best advice then to the newly elected members of the coming in for the 116th Congress? First thing, uh, remember what your mother told you? Be nice. Um, and secondly, think, think about the longer term ramifications of your doing rather than the, the extant matter that seems so important right at that moment. But think about it in the context uh, when you vote or when you take a position. Uh, listen to those who have some different points of view 
and uh, be willing to compromise if it comes to that. You can be a strong party person and very philosophically committed and still be able to make compromises. Uh, there's almost no state where a senator represents more than about 55% of the vote. The other 45 voted against that person, roughly. You're supposed to represent everybody. Now, you can't always represent everybody because they have different points of view. But think about the 45 that aren't getting much of a voice if you're never, ever willing to listen to that other point of view. That's one way to think of it. I, the main advice is talk to your, your colleagues and talk things out. And it's real easy to smell out that which is purely political, and don't pay any attention to that. But if they've got a good argument, pay attention to that. Who's your closest friend on the other side of the aisle? If you're of the past 30 years, you've been oh, in Oh, golly. You see, you get, in, you get in trouble when you start naming names because everybody thinks they're your best friend. You know, that's not in my case. But, uh, <laughs> um, but there, there are some very fine members of the Democratic uh, Caucus in the Senate who it's been a privilege to work with. Uh, one that I've worked, you've mentioned the last, you know, for the whole time I've been there, which is uh, 30 years, if you count my five years out, Diane Feinstein from California. Uh, nobody would confuse her with being a conservative Republican, but um, I trust her, and I think she trusts me. And if you have personal trust of somebody, uh, then you can talk about things and make deals, potentially, without fear that you're going to get into trouble because somehow or other the other side is going to use it against you. And um, find the people that are like that. And I would say that more, more than not... Um, fall into that category if you give them a chance. So I want to turn the discussion a bit to some um, of your past year. You've had an eventful year. I think we can agree. You were tasked with, as you indicated, shepherding Justice Kavanaugh through the confirmations process and then appointed to serve in the late Senator John McCain's <coughs> Senate seat until a spe special election in 2020. Could you explain a bit more about your role in responsibilities as Justice Kavanaugh's guide? Yes. Um, I. After I left the Senate, I joined the law firm Covington and Burling and uh, uh, basically was just happy practicing law there and being involved in some other activities like the American Enterprise Institute. The White House counsel called me one day and said, uh, we need somebody to Sherpa our nominee. He wasn't even at that first telephone call going to tell me who it was. Uh, would you potentially be interested? And I knew that this would mean that I would have to leave all of the things that I was currently doing with the law firm, um, uh, not resign from the firm, but take a leave of absence in effect. Um, so I checked with the firm and they said, if, if that's what you think would be useful to do, do it. So um, we then had subsequent conversation. I came back here on the Monday that uh, Judge Kavanaugh, the, the president, announced his uh, nomination uh, at the White House and began immediately working with the White House Counsel's Office, Judge Kavanaugh, and some other people that were brought in to help support his nomination. And my job, as you said, was to introduce him around to my former colleagues in the Senate and go with him to meetings to help the conversation move along. I didn't need to do much of that. Uh, and to do follow-up if there were questions to make sure that the senators got the answers that they needed and so on. Um, we had a couple of sessions where he practiced appearing before the committee for his first committee hearing, and that went all just fine. And it was roughly in this time frame that Senator McCain then passed away that I was appointed, and very shortly thereafter, as I said, Professor Ford or maybe it was right at that very same time her allegations were made public. And um, at that point, I'm now in the Senate, and I've got to deal with it from that perspective. By the way, at one point, somebody had raised the question about whether there was a problem with me being able to vote on a nomination that I had been pushing. I didn't support Judge Kavanaugh as a professional matter, as a legal matter. I was not uh, doing that for the law firm. I never got paid a dime. The law firm didn't get anything out of it, um, except the lack of my services during that time. <laughs> and uh, so, no, there was no conflict in 
working for a good man as a private citizen and then being put in the position of being able to vote on him eventually. Did you know him before this? I had only, no, not, not really. I had met him before, but I, I can't say we really were friends. How are some of the closed door interactions compared to the public hearings? Similar. Interesting. Fa yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, and I guess I can tell a couple of stories. Maybe I won't use names. I'll maybe use one. First of all, I learned a lot. Judge Kavanaugh is a teacher, as you know, he has taught uh, in law school. And he's kind of a, a born teacher. He likes to explain things. I guess he's it's one reason for his long opinions. But I learned a lot in the questions that were asked of him and the way he responded to those questions with my colleagues. And a lot of times these were repetitions, so some of it finally sunk in. I, I think I have a pretty good idea of his approach now to, uh, as an originalist, I think he would agree that he fits that bill. And um, it really took me back to law school days and thinking a little bit more about how judges should approach judging. Uh, they, they, they need to have some kind of a standard and template, uh, whether it's an originalist one or not. And of course, we all learn in law school there are certain ways you learn to interpret a case or to um, interpret precedent and the like. Uh, a lot of rules of the game that you apply as a lawyer and a, a, as a judge. But to hear him explain how he would do that was, was interesting. I'll, I'll give you one illustration because I think he spoke about it publicly. He, said, he has a great respect for Judge Garland on the uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. They became great friends. And he said, I kept wondering, why do we keep re reaching a different conclusion in all of these uh, administrative law cases? Uh, and he said, it finally dawned on me that we just had a different threshold for the question of ambiguity. The statute's ambiguous. He said, we'd be having a conference. I'd tell my colleagues, well, here's my reading of the statute. And they'd all say, well, we think you have the best reading of the statute, but we still think there's ambiguity. And he, he would say, that's the problem. If mine is the best reading of the statute, let's go with it. No, there's still ambiguity. Well, once there's ambiguity, you know the rest. Chevron, and then you have a whole series of things that tumble into play. And there are a lot of folks that don't think that's the best uh, way to interpret congressional uh, law. Uh, so little things like that, I think we're, we're elucidating. Uh, I will tell you that one Democrat senator, who I will not name, um, I mean, he, we walked out of that meeting, and I knew that, that Judge Kavanaugh was not going to get that person's vote, but they couldn't have been best buddies. They were slapping each other, and they, all they did was talk sports. So, okay, there's a clue. Um, and it was a very good meeting. Uh, this became one of his biggest opponents in the hearing as, at the end of the day. Um, but there, I will, the, the final point I'll tell you is that the the person who by far, no denigration of the others, because I would give a lot of them an A, but this was an A++ interview. Susan Collins conducted a two and a two hour and 20 minute cross-examination of Brett Kavanaugh, who would make any trial lawyer proud. She's not a lawyer, but she had asked 19 different lawyers to help advise her. They had read one or another of them combined, had read all of his opinions, all of his law review articles, all of his speeches, selected the components that she should read, which she did, and she knew well, had in mind, and they had developed a whole series of questions in different segments. And I'm telling you, it was like a law school exam, an oral exam for a PhD. Uh, she did a superior job, very <laughs> much like the speech that she gave on the Senate floor, which I think uh, rightfully will go down as one of the great Senate speeches. Uh, but she did a terrific job of um, ferreting out what she thought were the most important things about his temperament, about his philosophy of judging, um, about precedent, and about a lot of other subjects, which um, some of which came out in the hearing, but nobody could go into that much detail uh, as she did in the, in the private meeting in her office. I want to turn a little bit. You served with the late Senator McCain for 18 years. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship with him and any memories you'd like to share. Well, I was always the junior senator. <laughs> uh, John McCain was a very interesting uh, person and a remarkable person. Uh, everything that you heard about him in the uh, 
various services following his death uh, was true. That, that is to say, it all had a connection in the reality of who John McCain was. There were some references, humorous references to his personality, which wouldn't always fit into the, uh, who's the lady that wrote the, how, how to be a good person in fair society, you know. Can't think of it at the moment. In any event, John would occasionally curse. Um, <laughs> uh, and he did have a temper, uh, but it was off and on. And uh, he, uh, he had a capacity to forgive. I mean, he gave the North, forgave the North Vietnamese and a lot of political enemies, too. Uh, he, I think, had the best instincts in national security matters in the foreign policy sphere of anybody that I served with. Uh, he did not have the best economic instincts. Uh, my point is, we all are good at something and not so good at others. And I think he was one of the best when it came to national security matters. Uh, and I will tell you what one of the reasons is because he worked at it. He traveled so many weekends when he could have been home. He's off on a codel to some garden spot like Yemen or Iraq, um, places that weren't fun to go to, but he knew more world leaders and, and other uh, leaders. Uh, I think that he knew as many as any Secretary of State. And he went to conferences. He collaborated with a lot of foreign leaders and military folks as well. And by the way, he wasn't just a yes man for the military. In fact, they feared him probably more than anybody else because he, he knew what they were up to. So he could keep our military honest, but he also wanted to support the men and women in uniform. He was very serious when they were sent into a mission. They needed to have what it took to win. And you can understand why that's so. But he was good at strategy. And um, I, I really uh, respected that uh, about him. He cared a lot about our state of Arizona. Uh, he cared a lot about minorities. The Native Americans in Arizona were uh, a group that he uh, always wanted to help. Uh, so he was a complicated person, but I, I guess I'll just wrap it up this way. Teddy Roosevelt was his hero because of, and you've all read about Teddy Roosevelt getting into the dusty arena and fighting it out. And you may win some and you lose some, but if you don't try, you're never going to win. And if you uh, if you get uh, beat up, then you dust yourself off and fight another day. And that was, that was John's credo in life. And I used to kid him, you know, the, the gunslinger that would come through the barroom doors and you know, open them up like that, and they'd be slapping back and forth. Uh, somebody looking for a fight. Well, that was kind of John. Uh, he'd come on the Senate floor, and if there was a d big debate going on, he'd try to figure out which side he wanted to be on, and he'd join in. And if there wasn't one, he'd start one. And <laughs> I... I used to introduce him that way, and he didn't deny it. He laughed. Um, but um, it was an honor to serve uh, with him for 18 years, and uh, we need more people like him that had a broader view. I will say this. He, he always had that long view of how the Senate should operate and uh, how the minority should have its rights, and it didn't matter whether we were in the minority or the other side was in the minority. Can you discuss a little bit about when you became aware that you might be appointed to the Senate and why you said yes when you seemed to be pretty happily <laughs> retired after a career in public service? <clears throat> I think I've disclosed before that the first time I said no, but this was um, uh, some time before uh, we, we knew that the end was near for John. Uh, the second time, the governor gave me a way out. He, he said... Uh, <coughs> This is going to be a real crisis. We need to have somebody that knows what they're doing, that can hit the ground running. Uh, you know how to do it. And I think you'd be less objectionable than a lot of people. Um, <laughs> and uh, you can do it for as long as you want. And how do you say no at that point? And it's been a wonderful experience, a great honor. As I said, the best part of the experience is I was so surprised about how nice everybody <laughs> was. Um, but... Um, I, I had retired from the Senate. I want to be retired from the Senate. And I really think since there's literally four years left on his term, uh, uh, starting January 3rd, but under state law, the person appointed will have to run again in 2020. And I have no interest in doing that. 
and I, he needed, the governor needed to know that. Uh, I think it would be wise if he appoints somebody who can be an incumbent and who might have a reason, uh, you know, have an interest in running again. And that's not me, so um, he knows that my, my time will be limited, but we're gonna see it through at least to the end of this Congress. And uh, it's been, a, as I said, a real honor and a privilege to again represent the people of Arizona. It kind of reminds you, you know, after five years, it's a little more distant. It reminds you of what it was all about, and it's all about representing people. So this is primarily an audience of the Federal Society's DC Young Lawyers chapter, and some here are serving in government right now, some aspire to perhaps serve an elected office one day, but I think everybody here is very public service minded. What advice might you have for young lawyers as they are beginning their careers? Any habits or hobbies, other things that you might suggest that they If you ever want to run for office, stay out of trouble. <laughs> 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 Lee, uh, if, if you have any thought about running for office, just stop and think before you do anything that's on the edge. Uh, do I Because everything comes out. I mean, we all know that, right? Um, whatever you do, uh, it, it will be public sooner or later if you run for office. So first of all, lead the kind of life that uh, you don't mind the public being fully aware of. Um, it's also a good idea to do that up for general principles. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, the, the other advice is, uh, if you want to be successful, be the best you can be at whatever you're doing, whether it's a government position, or you're in private practice, you're in teaching, or whatever it is, strive to be excellent, to be the best. And you'd be surprised when opportunities come along how that positioning will probably put you in the best position to run. I had a good friend uh, from early freshman college who always wanted to be a U.S. senator. And it was a goal of his. And I think he oriented himself so intently on that goal that he made decisions in life that were inimical to succeeding at the goal. And I've always thought about that and, and thought, if you just do your best at whatever you're doing and, and you know, be honest and, and don't make stupid mistakes, if the opportunity comes along, you'll have that opportunity, and then you can potentially take advantage of it. And you'll have the skills to potentially succeed because you've done the best you can at whatever you're doing. And to be a very good lawyer uh, makes it uh, a lot easier, I think, to be a political candidate and to be a member of the Congress. I'm glad we have a lot of people who aren't lawyers, but I will tell you that being a lawyer helps. Uh, being able to be persuasive helps. And whether you're an advocate in the courtroom or a transaction lawyer, you're still bargaining, you're still advocating, you're still trying to convince people. And uh, I mean, you're still lobbying in effect. And uh, those are skills that will stand you in good stead if you want to be involved in politics. Do you have any writers or political ideas that you find interesting or inspiring? Any of my political ideas that are interesting? Or, or others, <laughs> others. I mean, a book, writers that you... Oh, or somebody whom I've uh, uh, studied or... Yeah. Uh, I think I, I find it lamentable that young people today are not schooled in the philosophy of the Founding Fathers. If you don't understand that, you don't understand what our country is all about. And if you don't understand that, it's hard for me to see how you could be persuaded to fight and die for your country or to make other sacrifices, or to even have much of an incentive to be involved in any kind of political dialogue. And you're not gonna make good decisions as a citizen. If you travel the world, you see it, it, it really becomes clear what a difference there is between a country that's predicated on an idea, the USA, and countries that are accidents of history or war or somebody else drawing boundaries uh, because of war or tribal uh, divisions or the like. Um, the Declaration of Independence, I think, says it all. First of all, we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's the idea, or one half of the idea. And the other half of the idea is, so how does a government turn that into reality? And that's the very next sentence. But it's the consent of the governed. 
public officials accountable to we the people. If our public servants are truly public servants, then they're there to protect the liberties that we just said we're starting out with. That's the whole idea of the United States of America. And if you understand that, first of all, I think it's pretty inspiring. I think it's true. I think it's the, it's the core thing, individual freedom. Now, there are those whose political philosophy is counter to that. They have a different philosophy. Good patriotic Americans have a different philosophy about what the most important thing is. And it's not individual liberty. I happen to think, as the founders did, it's individual liberty. Life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. There is not much that's not encompassed within that. But the government, if, if that's true, the government certainly should not impinge upon that in any way, and it ought to effectuate it. And our government was set up to effectuate it. That's how we got the three branches of government, the checks and balances, and all of the other things that are embodied in the Constitution. And if young people understood those things, I think they would make better decisions politically about political candidates. Uh, they would understand more uh, what the basis for decisions is that may seem odd to them, um, and frankly, be willing to fight uh, for those principles. Henry Kissinger once uh, told me uh, that he thought it was almost impossible for any leader in Europe now to lead uh, a nation into defending itself in, in war, that is to say, in a, an existential war. Uh, because the people there didn't really believe in anything worth fighting for. Uh, now, that's an overstatement, and it's certainly not true of some countries in Europe. But his point was that um, the United States is different, and there are a lot of Europeans whose primary problem-solving technique now is to continue to talk, even when it's obvious talk has failed. And they're very reluctant to take action. And I don't mean that as an indictment of European leaders, please, but um, people have to believe in something, at least I think they'd, they'd ought to believe in something to go fight uh, and potentially uh, give up their life. And I wish more Americans than are willing to sign up to the military uh, had that deep a belief in what this country is all about and were willing to fight for it. So it sounds like the fact that civics and history is de-emphasized now in schools, you know, can somewhat create this climate of divisiveness. People don't understand founding first principles and how, you know, how the different I believe branches that, work. Yes, I, I believe that's all tied in. And so to the people I admire and read, uh, uh, read not just the founders, the Federalist Papers, the biography, there's great biographies in the last 20 or so years of our founders now. But you, you learn from those biographies who the people were that were influential to them, like Locke and, and Adam Smith and um, Edmund Burke and, and so on. You, you begin to see um, why they were um, willing to abide by the democratic process to a point, and why they also thought some constraints on that were probably useful, uh, and why they also thought education was such a key component. An educated citizenry can act well in a democracy, but if you're asking people to vote to make the decisions, and you're not educating them, you're asking for trouble. And so I would recommend people read a lot of history, including the founding of this country. So I have, I have one more question. Are, are you willing to answer some questions from the audience? Do you have yes, time? Yes, I am, but with one uh, constraint. <laughs> um, I'm speaking candidly here, and I don't want to take questions that would require me to speak ill of anybody. Understood. Uh, one before before we turn things over to the audience, and I know we have a, a microphone we could we could pass around. Do you have any final message for the young lawyers here as the future of the Federalist Society? I know you've been very kind to speak to this group a number of times, and I know you've spoken with our Phoenix Lawyers chapter as well, and right. you've always been a very welcome. Yeah. Guest. Yes. Yes, I do. I mean, you you all have made a huge difference. 
All young people want to make a difference. They all want to make the world a better place, right? And we as lawyers try to do that. Uh, you all have made a big difference, and you might not realize how big a difference, but when, uh, I mean, there was no Federalist Society when I was a young lawyer. Um, you know what's happened in the law schools and what's happened to the American Bar Association. Um, I, I'm not speaking ill of anyone. Um, <clears throat> but um, when a particular ideology takes over the legal profession um, without any pushback, eventually the law will suffer. And it was time that somebody pushed back against some of the doctrines that were beginning to take hold, some of the ideology that was beginning to take hold. The Federalist Society has performed that function and performed it so well that it has even influenced now scores of people who are on the federal bench and undoubtedly on the state courts as well. Um, and, and I think you're all aware of the influence that uh, Leonard, the Federalist Society, others have had on uh, the decisions of the current president and who he has deemed uh, worthy of appointment to the federal uh, bench. Uh, this is an enormously successful um, project in a relatively short period of time. You've made a difference and you've provided a good counterpoint to some folks uh, that aren't as tolerant of different points of view as the Federalist Society is, I would say. Well, I appreciate hearing that. Uh, with that, I'll open things up for a couple of questions. I see. Senator uh, Kyle, can you hear me? <clears throat> Welcome back to Washington. Uh, we haven't had people like you in this town for quite some time, and it's great to come back. And if I can do one thing to start my question is just to lead a standing ovation for you coming back. That'll, that'll just take time, that's all right. Okay. Listen, I really appreciate it, thank you. Give it to me at the end, how's that? Thank you. Okay, I'm, I am the unusual aardvark, I'm a New York State Republican and somehow I've survived up there. But I've noticed, and it's not been lost on me and you've referenced it as well, that the upstate Northern Republicans have lost their credence. Um, and we've lost people like you, uh, people like uh, Senator Nichols from uh, Oklahoma, who was the last guy in 1991 to push through an appropriation bills and keep the trains running on time. Um, but my question for you is more focused on not what brought you here, but what you learned within that first six or 12 months that you were here about how you needed to govern once the authority had been thrusted on you and you realized that you had this authority and you needed to bring people together and what you did, because it's obviously something we don't see now anywhere in the news, the divisiveness, the politics of personal destruction, the Kavanaugh hearings and all of that. Um, and is there some sine qua non that you brought that is like out of the greatest generation or the generation where you are right out of that that could be visited on all these? They're very young. I got a little gray hairs, but yeah. Let, first of all, let, let me dispel the notion that um, that a lot of my Senate colleagues today wouldn't like to engage in good old bipartisan problem solving. Most of them, many of them were in state legislatures. Uh, they all came to get things done. Uh, they all, as politicians, get along pretty well with other people and they try to, they, they like doing that. That's what politicians do. So, um, I am no different than anybody else, and I'm certainly no better. Uh, I am not condemning my colleagues at all when I say that it's up to us. You know, we're all responsible for our actions. That was my point before. Uh, and it's a situation where a lot of good people have gotten into kind of a bad mood. And uh, part of it is the shirts and skins attitude. You know, you put on your jersey when you get sworn in, and you better be loyal to that team. So it's. It's hard to break out of that, uh, but I don't mean to suggest that most of my colleagues might not like to break out of that if they could, but the political pressures are 
daunting. And in a way, that's bad. In another way, what are we here for? We're supposed to represent our constituents. But that's the key. If you're representing just a very small vocal group of your constituents to the exclusion of most of the rest, then you're probably not being very courageous. Yeah, they may be the ones that have the political clout, but that's not really representing everybody. So the, the, the key is to think about representing everybody in your state. And it doesn't come to you back here. It comes to you when you're back home. And you're sitting on the front porch with somebody who tells you a story that about a hardship in their family or an illness or whatever, and you want to do something about it. And that happens to us all. And so we come back here then to try to work with each other. And since we all know people like that, it isn't hard for Democrats and Republicans to start talking to each other about solving those kind of problems. Um, where, where, we, where we run into differences is, um, I'm more willing to spend money on the military than a friend of mine on the other side of the aisle who's more willing to spend money on a national health care system. Well, you know, I can make my case, that person can make uh, his or her case. Um, neither one of us are necessarily right or wrong, but we just have a little different orientation as to where we ought to be prioritizing. So if we have a little more... Um, willingness to give good faith to the other point of view, uh, we could get back to where we're... And, and by the way, I was going to say where we used to be. The old days weren't so great either. I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of times in our history when people were beating each other over the head with canes, and uh, uh, which actually happened on the Senate floor. And at least we're not doing that these days. So, there, No, there, there, there wasn't one time when I thought, boy, this is what representation is all about. But it was the cumulative effect of visiting with a lot of constituents. And I'll, I'll tell you, here's, here's some examples. I go into a coffee shop, and here are three or four old guys sitting with their caps pulled down over. You know, maybe they haven't shaved that morning, and they're having a cup of coffee and talking to each other. And you ask them if you can join them, and they sit down. And I mean, you sit down and talk to them. And you think, um, you know, did, are these guys, what's their background? The next thing you know, you know, I'm making this up, but one of them, got a medal of honor and you know another one has a couple purple hearts from serving another one was the ceo of some big corporation another one was a superintendent of a big school and responsible for educating a lot of kids and then you realize wait a minute these are all really substantial people who contributed a lot to our society don't judge people by what you first see um, this country is made up of a lot of really great people and you probably don't see it the first time that you see them you have to get to know them to really realize it. So don't, don't judge, and certainly don't judge negatively. And the other thing is, when you think about a political campaign, I remember I was so stupid the first time I ran, I thought, well, if I lose, that's fine. I go back to the practice law, everything's great. If I win, I got a new opportunity to learn something new and serve. And about two weeks later, or three weeks later, after you realize all of these people that have really volunteered for your campaign, they've contributed to your campaign, they're working their hearts out for you, you got to win it for them. you got to win because they're doing so much for you. And that's when it dawns on you. This is, this is for your constituents, for your friends and neighbors and your, your folks. It's not, a, it's not all about you. really appreciate your service and, and returning to Washington to serve as well. I want to ask about polarization and realignments. You talked about how the parties have realigned geographically on a broad sense. Southern Democrats are a thing of the past. But one thing that seems to be getting a lot of attention lately, and I'm interested in your opinion, what about the, the fact that the polarization by urban and rural population density seems to be a major driving factor of the distance culturally and policy-wise between the two sides of our political spectrum, mm -hmm. where Sunbelt cities are voting similar to uh, northeastern cities. What do you think causes this? And what can Washington do to bridge or smooth over some of the divergent interests and cultures that seem to be developing in our country? Yeah, I think you really have to drill down into the phenomenon to understand it, uh, rather than take a superficial analysis of it. And I don't mean to suggest that your analysis uh, is superficial, but 
for example, Sunbelt cities. Uh, I know a lot of Sunbelt cities that voted very conservatively and a lot that voted less conservatively. It all depends where you are in the Sunbelt and what the history is and what, what those people are like. Phoenix, I guess, is a Sunbelt city. We have an enormous Republican registration advantage and generally vote very uh, Republican. Tucson is just slightly south of us, also in the Sun Belt, I would argue. It's more of a liberal university town. I think the fact that, um, uh, that the university is there has an influence on it. Look at most university towns. Uh, so it's more a matter of where people congregate and what their political attitudes are as they congregate there. And I also think the urban-rural thing has more to do with culture than anything else. Politics follows culture. Culture is what, is what determines how people think about things, and then that gets translated in the political arena to a political party. Um, people in more rural environments have a different attitude than people in the middle of a big city, I know. I was born in Nebraska in a little town. I know it's still there, but it, it does not have a thousand people in it. And I lived in a small town of less than 3,000. And then I grew up in, and went to high school and graduated there from a town that was less than 3,000 people. There were 100 people in my graduating class. Um, and I had livestock the whole time I was growing up. And so I know what the rural environment is like. And folks are a little different in the ranching west and in the farming midwest, for example, and in agrarian areas of the south than they are in the middle of big cities. You have to learn different skills. Uh, you have different kinds of attitudes about your neighbors and about the small town and, and so on. And one is not better or worse than the other, but uh, people tend to uh, you know, reflect the value of the cultures that they're growing up in or they're living in. And that can have an impact on, on how you think politically. One fairly obvious example is on the Second Amendment. I, I, I'm just thinking this through right now, but most people in the rural areas are very familiar with guns. Uh, most of them, or a lot of them, hunt. My dad kept food on our table by uh, hunting. Uh, I don't own a gun. I'm in a different era, a different environment. I didn't learn to hunt and do all of that stuff. Uh, and nor do most people I know that live in Washington, D.C. Now, you can argue, well, there are a lot of guns here, too, but they're in the wrong hands. Um, I just think it, it's, it's what you grew up with. Uh, I will tell you, uh, you know, I'm not saying small-town people are more religious necessarily, but... Uh, I know a lot of small communities where uh, the church in town is a big part of the community and it seems like you're all part of the church. Uh, whether that makes you more faithful or not um, would be a good question. But there are just different ways of life and therefore you establish different attitudes. The, the culture matters and your politics is going to reflect that to some extent. Nice thing about our country is that we can move anywhere we want to, and unfortunately, families are breaking up. I wish my grandkids lived as close to me as I did to my grandparents, for example. Uh, and that, that has an influence, but it tends to break up that phenomenon that you and I are talking about here. So it's not something that's going to kill the country. Um, uh, it, just, it has always been the fact that different people in different areas vote differently than others, and that's, you know, that's our big wonderful America. Uh, I, I don't think we have to try to move people into town or move towns folks out in the country to do something about our political environment. But I do think we need to be a pay, pay a lot of attention to our culture. And I think a lot of folks are worried that culturally, um, young Americans are moving further away from um, some of the notions that uh, informed those of us who are a little bit older uh, that we think are important. I, I mentioned the education about the foundation of our country. Uh, fortunately, young people have an access to a lot more information than, than I did, and they're a lot better informed. 
but not necessarily about some of the things that they should be informed about. So, you know, our society uh, adapts to all of these things. And the nice thing about the United States of America is that we have the freedom because that's our number one value. And we don't need somebody else to tell us what to do. Again, I wouldn't tinker with the system. I'd focus it on the people and uh, inspire the people to be the best they can be. And they'll elect good leaders and support the leaders that are good leaders. And good leaders can help us to have good government. Senator Kyle, I was wondering if you could address the um, centralization in Congress uh, from um, some of the more committee-driven structures that had been in the past towards much more, um, I think a lot of our budgeting now is negotiations amongst the congressional leaders rather than it being from the body as a whole. Um, so anything can be done to reverse this trend to push, um, push for some of the congressional functions back to a much more spread out amongst Congress rather than it being you know, yeah. sort of the closed door negotiations amongst, uh, amongst leadership? Yeah. Um, that's the regular order. Uh, have bills come through the committee and be debated in committee and amended in committee and then come to the floor and have the same process again and then work the will of the House and then go over to the Senate and do the same thing again. And that, that's the regular order concept, which probably produces the best result because more people have more hands on it, and more eyes on it. And it gets scrubbed a lot better and it has more consensus and therefore more buy-in when it's done. That's the theory and I think that's correct. Um, the problem is when you're not able to, to get things done right, uh, they get pushed into little piles, like for example, appropriation bills. And um, in order to bring Congress to a close, somebody has to negotiate the final packages. And they're frequently big packages with lots of moving parts. And the, rep the staff of the four leaders, and maybe somebody from the White House sitting in a room negotiating all these different things and deciding which ones go in the bill, which ones don't go in the bill, making deals and not having the input of all of the members, but reflecting sometimes the parochial interest of those leaders as well as their interest for their body as a whole. And the decisions are less likely to be broadly based, uh, fully vetted, uh, scrubbed, sandpapered, whatever word you want to use, and less likely to have buy-in from more people and therefore uh, sometimes less longevity as, as a result. Things that are rammed through uh, tend to be dealt with later on more than one occasion. And uh, whereas if you have something that's bipartisan um, and gets a, a pretty good vote when it gets uh, passed, uh, it's likely to stand the test of time uh, better. So how do you how do you deal with that phenomenon? Um, I mean, there are a lot of answers to that. The, the people who, like uh, oh, Trent Lott was a, an advocate of this, certainly uh, Mitch McConnell is, they're trying to get back to more of a regular order way of doing things. McConnell is an old appropriator. He'd love to have the Appropriation Committee do its job. He really enjoyed doing that. When he was on the Appropriations Committee, he knows how it works. And that's a lot better than having him do it as a sole member of the Senate, along with Nancy Pelosi. Uh, But that gets back to the whole question of how you uh, make sure that both the House and Senate do what they're supposed to do and in the time they're supposed to do it. And that's, we could have many more evenings discussing that and probably be <laughs> profitable to have people with different points of view than mine as well. Uh, it takes leadership. Well, with that, uh, thank you so much, Senator Kyle, for joining us today. Thank Please you. join me in, in thanking. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.